Problem-oriented policing is one of the most important innovations in American policing in the last 25 years. Our guest is Herman Goldstein, the founder of, of Problem-Oriented Policing. I'm Sam Walker. Herman, the 1979, you wrote an article in an academic journal on a problem-oriented approach to uh, policing. This article has had an enormous influence uh, in American policing. Uh, just briefly, can you tell us what is problem-oriented policing? Well, it's, it's uh, been identified as a philosophy, as a program, etc. I like to see it as this. Uh, it essentially is an effort to uh, refocus attention in, within police departments and to integrate in, uh, into, into, into police operations a concern about the substance of policing, about what police do and the impact of their work. And it's an effort to, to look at specific parts of police business, the pieces of police business, whether it, and the behavioral problems that they have to deal with, uh, to examine those problems in great detail and in great depth in ways that they have not been examined in the past to try to find out what gives rise to them. Um, and uh, having, do having done that and having engaged in the analysis in some depth, uh, to come up with uh, new strategies and new responses for dealing with them that have emphasized two things. One is prevention, and the other is a possible use of alternatives to the criminal justice system as a way of dealing with the problems. Right. And then to implement that and evaluate it and contribute to the building of knowledge about how to respond to those problems. But problem-oriented policing is important because it's, it's really a pretty radical alternative to what you've called the generic approach to policing. What, can you tell us what the generic well, approach is? Well, the, the, the traditional policing, the standard model of policing, has several different strategies for dealing with problems on the street, whether it's patrol, whether it's investigation of cases. I call these generic responses. In problem oriented policing, uh, w one comes up with a strategy in response to each of the specific problems that police confront, and there are hundreds of them, and that is based upon uh, an analysis research and, 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 and is driven by data. The, the standard model is not research-based or does not driven by? Well, it, it, it's, there's been a lot of research relating to the standard model, but uh, I think it's correct to say that for the most part it has just evolved over the years and, uh, and the field is very wedded to these generic responses that they often use without thinking through what might be a more appropriate response to a specific problem, because each of these problems is very dif different one from the other. Good, we'll have a chance to get into some of those specific kinds of problems. Let's talk now about the, the origins of problem-oriented policing. Uh, where did this idea come from? Um, when, was there a moment when the light bulb suddenly went on? No, not by any means. Uh, I uh, calculated the other day that I've now been working on policing problems and issues for over 50 years. And um, the concept is an, uh, evolved in that whole period of time. Uh, I look back at some periods when you know, I was very naive as to how I perceived the police function. Uh, but uh, it came about as a result of several very specific experiences. One was my early participation in the American Bar Foundation study, a landmark research project. And then my experience with the uh, uh, Chicago Police Department, uh, f where I was located for some four years. Uh, subsequent to that, University of Wisconsin, which provided me with an academic base for developing these things. Uh, work on some major projects like the President's Commission. Uh, and uh, and uh, subsequently, uh, various efforts to try to implement problem born policing. So I'm learning, I'm still learning about it, but it's something that has evolved over a period of close to 50 years. And it really was based on these early experiences you had with the Bar Foundation in, in Chicago, for example. Okay. But let, we'll come back and, and talk about each one of these uh, experiences uh, in, in depth uh, individually. But let's begin by talking about the American Bar Foundation uh, project. And this was a, a very uh, important uh, landmark study of the, the entire criminal justice system, really the first uh, direct observation of, of police officers uh, at work. One of the more important products was uh, Wayne LeFay's book, Arrest, that uh, many students in criminal <coughs> justice are familiar with. Uh, tell us about the, your involvement with the Bar Foundation project. Well, I, th I think the most important thing to acknowledge at the outset, the Bar Foundation study was indeed very, very unique. It came along at a time when there was a craving for, a great desire for more insight as to what was actually happening out there. And uh, under funding, uh, sponsored by the, the Ford Foundation, um, 
they assembled a team of, of observers uh, with specialties in policing, prosecution, courts, probation, parole, and they were to go out into the field and discover what was really going on. And that uh, was achieved by uh, connecting with the various inter uh, national associations, so we had a kind of access that had never previously been provided. And the objective was to not talk about policy, to not look at books, to not look at manuals, but to look at what was actually happening on the streets, in the courts, in the prisons. This was 1956, uh, early 56, the, the first field observations. Uh, but prior to that time, there really hadn't been any direct observation of you know, police at work in terms of what they actually did. Um, so your, your first uh, experience was in Milwaukee and then later Detroit? Well, the, the study initially was committed to studying the entire country, but it got bogged down in about in, th in three states because there was so much to discover. Uh, the first was in, in Wisconsin, uh, the large city being Milwaukee. We also studied a lot of rural areas. We moved then to, de to, to Michigan, to Detroit, and, uh, and then uh, subsequently Kansas. You went out, you and the other members of the team went out in the field, uh, first observations of, of policing. Uh, what did you find? What was it that really surprised you? Well, the, the goal was, first of all, the goal was to understand the system as a system, to see how cases flew, you know, actually went through the system. Um, there were a number of things that immediately become, became apparent. One was that what we were observing was in sh such sharp contrast with uh, previously established images of how the police and other agencies uh, operated. Great informality, um, enormous discretion being exercised by officers uh, on, on the beat, a lack of coordination between and among uh, um, uh, the different parts of the system, uh, uh, the importance of the role of the individual officer as distinct from the executives up on top of the organization in determining what was actually going on. And probably one of the most significant things was the fact that we discovered uh, in all of this informality uh, some very strongly established practices that involve large numbers of people that were being processed through the system in an informal sort of way. Can you give us an example? of? Well, for example, in the Detroit operation, um, we noticed that the Detroit Department was reporting that every year they arrested around 18,000 uh, prostitutes. And uh, we discovered that there was a unit within the department that had an organized program of harassing prostitutes in which they would go out, arrest them, bring them in for a night's detention, and let them out in the street. And it was very routinized. So in many respects, it was a very structured but informal operation. These people never got into a court. There was nothing in the, in the criminal law of the state of Michigan that authorized this process uh, and this practice. But it nevertheless was there and accounted for a large piece of police business. So that would be one particular problem that later on you developed problem oriented policing to, to deal with. In a, in yeah, you know, it began to, th it, it fed my, my early thinking about the fact that what police were doing with regard to prostitution was radically different than what they were doing with regard to homicide or with regard to uh, house burglaries. Right. And prior to the Bar Foundation research, uh, uh, people would think of policing in terms of what, what the criminal law said. If this what the right. law says, that's what the police do. A very mechanical process. The law is the law, we enforce the law, we do it across the board. And if the chief said, here's our policy, that's what happened, and you, your research discovered that, well, actually, officers on the street there were was doing... No, there was no relationship between what was happening on the street and the provisions in the criminal law of Michigan. Right. And so this, this really was a landmark uh, uh, you know, finding of, of what, what the reality of, of policing was, was really all about. So, I, th I, I think you know, that can be punctuated by um, um, an observation that was made by a criminologist at the time, Don Cressy, who was one of our, our advisors and who said that uh, we had rewritten the books in criminology because one couldn't discuss uh, the things that were being discussed in those books without now taking acknowledgement of the real world that we had uncovered. Right. You've, you've said that uh, this was really a formative experience and it's always made you kind of a skeptic of what of official data and about policing and so on. 
Well, I think that's, that's one of the lasting impressions that uh, the Barr Foundation experience had on me, and that is that, and, and has affected my whole career, in that I, I, I've learned that unless one gets down to the bottom, unless one Turks talks to the people who are actually carrying out the job and observes what they're doing, uh, one can't be sure that one really understands what's going on, and that any research in criminal justice uh, is, is, is lacking, in my view, if it's based upon studies of policies, interviews, surveys, uh, and looks at, and examination of data without establishing what is happening on the street. All right. Uh, you mentioned prostitution enforcement in, in Detroit. Uh, what were some of the other problems that you discovered and observed? Well, as another example of a massive, uh, you know, practice that uh, that was uh, not visible to others. Is that uh, if 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 there were, uh, there were if there was a complaint about a dispute, domestic dispute, assault, and if the police responded, uh, and this was something in which people did not want police involvement, then they would simply ask for an ambulance uh, to take care of the injured, and the police would say, "We don't provide ambulances, but we also don't do anything about this kind of case." And they said, "If if you want to do anything about the assault or." pin it down, it's a civil matter, go see somebody else. But we only take, we only take case, those cases where there's a willing complainant who is going to prosecute the thing through the courts. And so domestic violence just simply wasn't reflected didn't, in official didn't reports? Even, it, was, it fell off the screen early on because you did not have somebody who was going to, f to file a complaint. Right. Now the, the, the Bar Foundation project, uh, you began with, with sort of a research agenda, a checklist, uh, but that you certainly soon you know, did, found that wasn't really useful. Can you explain? Well, this, this, this brings us into the whole business of you know, the, the, the focus with regard to the police aspect of the study. That is, there was a research plan. And the research plan with regard to police was to find out what was going on in these departments that, was, that, uh, that related to many of the questions that were being raised in what was then called the professional model of policing. How did the police department operate? Was it properly allocated? What kind of uniforms were officers using? What kind of cars? How many officers were on beats? Questions of that kind with the assumption that if you could answer all those questions, you could give them a rating as to what kind of a police department it was. And that research plan was contained in the original proposal for the study. Um, I was sympathetic to that because that was the, largely the product of O.W. Wilson and his professional model of policing, and it was under O.W.'s sponsorship that I got involved in the study. But I, I, I had these, this deep feeding, feeling that this was not what the true issues in policing were, 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 was, were all about, and that there was this other whole area of police discretion, how decisions were made, the use of authority, et cetera. So there was a lot of tension about that, but gradually the, uh, the checklist got relegated to a, a very uh, inconsequential sort of position role in the, in the, in the study. But that, that that shift represented a real you know, paradigm shift in, in A major, major, major change. It was a very uh, a sore point for a period of time. We would uh, satisfy some of the pressures by quickly doing the checklist in the first day or so and then get on to the real business of finding out w what the police were doing, how they were doing it, how they were responding to cases, how they were interacting with the public. So the old... Uh, the old paradigm was these very formal aspects of, of you know, patrol cars, uniforms, and so on. The real work, the real work of policing, is what's going on out in the street, and that's what you uncovered in the. And I think your point is correct in terms of the change in the paradigm. That is essentially uh, our conclusion. There was that meeting all of the items on the checklist did not necessarily result in good policing, and that one had to go substantially beyond that uh, to look at the uh, at what was happening on the street. And what you found happening out in the street is there are really two important things that have, have influenced our thinking about police. First was this uncontrolled exercise of discretion. Right. And At the lowest levels of the organization. Right. So the lowest ranking people were making the most important uh, life and death issues. Decisions. And then the, 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 the second aspect is that police work consists of all these discrete problems. Yes, and that the function of the police was so ambiguous, so amorphous, and, and, and difficult. It was, it was much more than just 
enforcing the law, that they were being called in on so many different things. The other thing that we discovered very early on was the police operated under the notion they were omnipotent. They could handle all this stuff. Just give it to us and we'll take care of it. And in reality, we discovered that, pol that this powerful military armed organization was rather uh, limited in what it could do with the, with the problems of crime in a community. And one of the key uh, concepts of uh, problem-oriented policing is that the police need to you know, be realistic. Build, build partnership. Re being realistic means building partnerships with other agencies, uh, using non-criminal uh, alternatives to, to problems. And trying to prevent them in the first instance. Right. And all of, all of that is really rooted in this, this early experience back in I think in retrospect, I can say that, yes. Right, right. right. <laughs> uh, after the Barr Foundation project, uh, you went to uh, the University of Wisconsin Law School in 1964, right. and now opportunity to teach. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, while you were there, you were then uh, also became, uh, actually in 1960, you became uh, executive assistant to O.W. Wilson in Chicago. Chicago Police Department. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about OW and what was happening there? Yeah. The um, um, Chicago experience came before the, the university experience, but the um, uh, after uh, the experience in the Bar Foundation, having worked with um, O.W. Wilson, and despite my questioning of the checklist, which was largely his product, he invited me to become uh, uh, executive his executive assistant when I came to uh, when he was appointed in what was really essentially at that time a fluke, the uh, superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. Yeah. O.W. Wilson, the author of Police Administration, with the standard textbook uh, for many, many decades on, uh, on policing, uh, it really represents this, the traditional approach to, to uh, right, uh, That was the management. epitome of the professional model of policing. Right. Right. The professional model in, in brief? Uh, well, it, it was an effort to bring the police out of the dark ages to say that we have a body of knowledge or information that guides us in what we do. Um, it, it had elements of uh, raising the ethics of policing, um, the qualifications of police officers, uh, and um, the, the efficiency of the organization. Those were some of the key characteristics. Um, what kind of things did you do in, in Chicago as executive assistant? Well, if you relate it to the you know, professional model policing, uh, Chicago at the time was one of the uh, uh, very backward large city uh, police departments. Uh, hadn't been touched or reformed or uh, reorganized for many years. Uh, had pro serious problems of corruption. Uh, and it was when one of those problems became most acute that they decided they had to made a, make a dramatic change and uh, that's when they uh, had a nationwide search for a new police chief and it ultimately selected the person who had been appointed the head of the selection committee was O.W. Wilson who had previously been dean of the School of Criminology at California. Right. What kind of projects uh, did you want to attempt? Well, as you, can, uh, you could well imagine, if you've got a department that was down at, he at its heels where they couldn't even account for where their personnel were and what they were doing, uh, that uh, it required an incredible amount of, of fundamental work. And that's where the checklist came in handy. Uh, I, I long ago concluded that there's no sense trying to go on to advanced concepts of, of refining a police operation until you know where people are and where everything's in place and where they're reasonably well equipped and where if one person, well, uh, people can talk to each other and there are record systems and things like that. So it took us about a, a minimum of two years, which was miraculous at the time, but with all of this coming with the support of then Mayor Daley and his, his unlimited funds to totally restructure that department. We, in the first year, a thousand of the officers resigned uh, because they just were not interested in supportive of the, this kind of reform. So and at, uh, at, we, we had a revolution within the department. So at, at, at the time, 1960, when uh, you joined, the Chicago Police Department really didn't have a good record keeping system. Uh, they didn't, weren't, didn't have the equipment they needed. None. There, was, there were precincts in which they were, they were using their private cars because they didn't have any cars that were operating. Mm -hmm. So within two years, you really uh, applied the this. Oh, it, it was massive. You know, building buildings, remodeling buildings, 
purchasing close to a thousand vehicles, uh, uh, establishing training programs, establishing record systems, establishing internal investigation mechanisms. Uh, it was a very, very ambitious reform effort that was uh, achieved largely because we had the support of the community and the, and the city government. So that was a major achievement in the second largest police department in the country. Right? At the That's time, right. one and, and one that was certainly right. uh, gave the city and the people who were involved a great sense of pride. Good. But based on your Bar Foundation experience, you, you knew that there was something more that needed exactly. to be done. And how did, did you try to implement any? any I, after we were sitting on top of this nice, refined, cleaned up, you know, operation, um, and things were operating very efficiently to the point that they, they were you know, very impressive. Um, I had and several other people had the feeling that there's more to this that we've got to get at. We could get to calls very quickly, but there was a serious question, what did we do when we got there? Uh, how effective were we are in dealing with the problems in the end? We knew we were more efficient. Uh, we, were knew, we knew, for example, we were dealing with racial issues much more effectively. But were we solving problems? Were we being any better at dealing with street robberies than, than we were in the past? And that was begging additional questions as to what, what, are the, what are the goals, what are the objectives of change in policing? What was the program evaluation and policy planning unit that you? Well, uh, program evaluation and policy planning, that we, we, the acronym for that was PEP. And uh, that was that was an illustration of what what we were trying to do to reach you know, beyond the old efficiency professional uh, model. Uh, we had a large research unit in the department, but it was concerned with streamlining forms, developing the budgets, analyzing crime, um, uh, developing policies, very routine sorts of things. Many of which were. They were just part of the research and planning operations that were common in police departments around the country. But there was nothing in that unit that looked at the end product of policing. What, what were we doing? What the police actually do right. out, out there on the street. The problems that we were trying to handle out in the street and how effective we were in dealing with them. So the, the PEP unit was a small, almost token effort to bring together five, six people and assign to each one who were, had some potential that we identify and assign to them tasks to say, you know, in, in this bigger complex, what are we, how effective are we in dealing with street robberies? How effective are we in dealing with bicycle thefts? Uh, and we tried to focus in on the specific problems. That was the beginning of a, of a real focus on the problems. And uh, it was modest. It didn't really go very far. How did the commanders you know, take to this. They thought they were, you know, they were in new waters. They, they didn't quite understand why they were being asked to do this. They were very imaginative. In retrospect, you know, their inquiries were very superficial uh, and uh, just sort of assembled then current police myths and concepts about how, how we deal with this. But we, we, we didn't press in depth uh, the exploration, in, certainly in no way comparing to where problem police, problem oriented policing is today, but still the the germ of the idea. The germ of the idea of was there. Problem right. policing was there, and you're, it's this is really kind of the important linchpin between your Bar Foundation research, which opened up this right, yes, your view yeah. of policing and yeah. and uh, more formal program to try to, you know, change. And, I, and I, I should add, I didn't I didn't get as much enthusiasm for for that effort as I did for acquiring new cars and uh, new uniforms and uh, new communication systems. Right. Right. Herman, you were with the Chicago Police Department from 1960 to 1964. Then you joined the faculty at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, we'll talk more about your your teaching experience uh, in a minute. But in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson appointed the President's Crime Commission and issued its reports in 1967. Um, you were involved in that. You were author of uh, part of the uh, Prime Commission's report on the police, very important uh, document, and in particular, Chapter 2 on the role of the police. Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, this came on the heels of the Bar Foundation study and very fresh in our mind at the time. When I say our, I mean, my colleague at the University of Wisconsin was Frank Remington. Uh, who had been field director, a field director of research for the Bar Foundation. And uh, so when we were asked by the, um, 
the, the uh, staff of the commission, you know, what direction they should go. We argued strongly for building on the work of the Barr Foundation study, uh, and especially this discovery that so much of policing was uh, out of view, was not visible. And so they urged us to do what we could to bring that into the study. And that took two forms. And one of the primary thing, uh, um, efforts what related uh, is what is reflected in Chapter 2 of the Task Force Report, where we picked up on this discovery of police discretion. And what does one do about that? And uh, uh, at the time, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, there was many people out there, including the legislature, who were pressing to legislate with regard to police discretion on Miranda and other kinds of issues. And we urged that we could deal with many of the discretionary issues by getting police departments themselves to address those problems. That called for research, it called for them to ask questions of themselves of what they were doing about the use of force, about stopping and questioning and other things, and to come up with policies in the form that would imitate administrative rulemaking as a way of structuring that discretion within the department. People really take this for granted, that there's a department has a policy on, on domestic violence, on traffic stops, on use of non-lethal force, and so on. Uh, but this was really a, you know, fairly new. At there was, we examined police manuals in which there wasn't a single word said about many of these issues that we found to be so important in the Bar Foundation studies. Uh, they related exclusively to how the uniform was to be worn and, uh, and uh, you know, the fact that you can't accept gratuities and uh, what reports should be filed, et cetera. Again, we, we take this for granted now, but it was something new back then, and it was really was based on these, the, the Bar Foundation uh, research. What about the uh, Chapter 2 of the uh, task force report uh, regarding the police role? Well, the two I discovered early on, and that has continued through my career, are very, very much interrelated. Uh, within the larger context of the President's Commission study, there was this concern about what is the role of the police, and, uh, and should that be refined? And uh, that, um, that exploration went in two r radically different directions. One was a school of thought, which, which was that the police function has to be refined. And police officers ought to be dealing with crime and conducting serious investigations and divest themselves of all of these other things so that they could do that job um, more professionally, more thoroughly, et cetera. The other things being like, you know, low-level disorders. Yeah, uh, that was relegated. And that was what the, the commission recommended, a, uh, a p community agent. And that was a person of lower stature, lower qualifications, who was supposed to take care of all that stuff so that real police officers wouldn't have to concentrate on it. That was one school. The other school was that that was terribly unrealistic, that the nature of the police function uh, inevitably is going to be one as an emergency response organization that would have to handle a broad range of functions, that these were all interrelated and even more important, that some of the minor stuff was of greater concern to the public than the major stuff. And so we argued for the broader aspects of the police function, even though that was more ambiguous and more difficult to deal with. But within the deliberations of the Crime Commission, there was this, this conflict between Enormous this, this conflict. older view of or police as crime fighters, and some people just want to make it more efficient, and your emerging view of, of police as problem solvers. Right. How intense was that? Oh, it was ex extraordinarily intense, and and our and because the argument was not only are these not separable, uh, but that the the qualifications and talent required to deal with the lesser problems may be as great, if not greater, than dealing uh, somewhat mechanically with some of the more traditional uh, uh, crime problems. Moreover, the attitude of the community with regard to their police department depended to a great extent on how the police handled all those uh, minor things. So um, it, it was battled out, and I think there, were, there was, even though we created the community service uh, agent as a lesser job, that is, that was one of their recommendations. I think the ultimate uh, result was that um, that was another major change in, in the paradigm. That is, that there was now greater openness to the awareness that there was a lot out there that we've got to think through and explore. And uh, if that's the, to be the case, the, that, uh, that function consists of a, of, a, of a wide range of problems that, that 
that put down the basis for a lot of our subsequent exploration of specific problems. I think important there, the, the, your point that uh, these low-level problems that people really didn't take seriously or police departments didn't take seriously actually re require more skill and, and talent and training on the part of officers than the, the, what we think of as the big-time crime, the robbery and so on. Um, yes, much more skill and training, but also different kinds of resources. Illustration, at the time, public intoxication. You know, the goal was let's get somebody else to handle all the, pub the, the intoxicated people so the police will be free of that task. But there was very quickly a realization that the problem just doesn't go away and that one has to bring a response to, to bear. And exploration of the public intoxication problem as a problem resulted in bringing new responses to that, which ultimately resulted in the legislative proposal uh, provisions for dealing with the public inebriate as other than an arrest and bringing that person into a detox center. So that would be an illustration, and that accounted for thousands of cases that police previously were handled. But it didn't mean that police were out of the business. It meant that the police brought to bear a different kind of response based upon the in-depth exploration of that problem. Right. Police weren't out of the business, but they were thinking about their business differently. differently. Right. And that's, that's what ultimately led to you know, your broader concept. And that problem. public intoxication is different than homicide, this is different from burglary, and, and calls for this in-depth inquiry and the development of a strategy that is responsive to that particular problem. The uh, Crime Commission reports came out in, in 1967, uh, the enormous influence. I know when I entered criminal justice, this was one of the things I read and learned from it. It, it, it eventually has become sort of the conventional wisdom, but it was a new and very radical idea at the time, there in the mid-60s. Well, yeah, and, and, and I, think, I think one of the reasons we're focusing on it here is that over a period of time, it, it really emerged as a benchmark. You know, it, it, it changed attitudes a great deal, and it advanced enormously the, uh, the, some of the fundamental um, um, avenues of progress within police departments, as, for example, uh, the recruitment uh, of, uh, of college-trained uh, individuals into policing. Right. Um, Let's move now to your experience at uh, University of Wisconsin. Again, you leave Chicago in 64, join the faculty, and you begin teaching criminal law. How did that influence your thinking? Well, I, I should point out the connection here in the sense that you know, one of the things from the Barr Foundation study was that the Ford Foundation that sponsored that was anxious to, to perpetuate the value of their work in the Barr Foundation study. And so uh, among the things that, that they subsequently sponsored was my joining the faculty at the University of Wisconsin to develop an academic component relating to, to uh, uh, policing. Uh, so while I never taught criminal law as such, I was involved as part of the criminal law faculty and uh, had the great fortune of continuing to work with Frank Remington, who had been director of the Bar Foundation study. Frank was one of the leading teachers of criminal law in the, in, in the U.S. at the time. He had many graduate students who subsequently went out and taught criminal law in other law schools. And his approach to the criminal, teaching of criminal law was to depart a great deal from just teaching arrest, search, and, and, and seizure based upon uh, Supreme Court decisions. Uh, having all the data from the Bar Foundation study, he tried to look at these issues in the context of how they arose on the street on the street in the context of particular problems. Well, that, that was the next evolution, is that we were initially teaching how those issues arose on the street, but then we came to realize that the issues arose in a different context if you were thinking about uh, retail theft versus um, street robbery versus uh, dealing with organized crime. And so uh, as we produced teaching materials for law school students, we moved from the, the case studies of the Supreme Court to using Bar Foundation material to teach these issues in the context of administration to a third level, which was to teach these issues in the context of specific problems. So our last text consisted, was organized by problems, and we would teach prostitution, we would teach burglary, we would teach organized crime, and within those issues, we would look at issues like wiretapping. And if, I can tell you that if you look at wiretapping in the context of street prostitution, you come up with different answers and different insights 
than is if you look at it in the context of organized crime. So it's really kind of a paradigm shift here in, in the teaching of uh, criminal justice and what the police do. Yes. Shifting away from what the Supreme Court says, and that being the last final word on it, to looking at what public what, policy should be. What, what police act do, what prosecutors actually do. A and not only what they do, but what they should do. And uh, so, for example, uh, if you look at something, uh, there's hardly anything in the statutes that talks about undercover work in policing. And yet, uh, to look at undercover work in the context of street prostitution versus undercover work in the context of organized crime, you come up with get different guidelines as to what you would want to authorize and, and tolerate. Right. Two different kinds of problems. Exactly. And the call for different responses, mm -hmm. it calls for th thinking about what, what the appropriate response is. Right. Um, um, so this, 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 this emerging paradigm, uh, it, it's really being disseminated partly through Frank Remington's students who went out to, to teach uh, in other law schools. Uh, the textbooks, you, you were co-author with Frank? Yeah, I was co-author with Frank and two, and two or three other members of the faculty, who all of whom joined in the teaching of these courses, uh, of several textbooks, uh, in an effort to influence the teaching of criminal law in law, law schools around the country. But the, the experience of teaching gave you time to reflect, to think. Oh, well, th that was true in so many ways. That is, that having the base at, uh, at, at a university, at the University of Wisconsin, at the law school, which had a long tradition for interdisciplinary studies and was very open to this kind of exploration, provided me, I couldn't have done what I did otherwise, provided me with the base uh, where I could uh, go out into the world, relate to police people, come back. Uh, rehash things, rethink things, bring them back into the academic settings. Yeah. We even brought, we had a police chiefs in residence program in which we had chiefs of police, very enlightened people like Bob Eigelberger from Dayton who came up and spent a year with us on the faculty uh, to build in and, and, and to try to address that enormous breach between the police and the practical field and academia. So you sent your, your students out into the field to observe? All of our students went into the field regularly. Uh, for observation in the course, in, in, as part of their courses. <coughs> and then we had, <coughs> again under Ford's sponsorship, we had a summer program in which 10 students each summer would spend internships in police departments around the country for the entire summer working on various problems in that, in that agency. So they're really extending that Bar Foundation experience of actually getting out into the field, looking at what actually happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you're sending them out with, with a clearer focus in terms of you've already determined that there are particular problems. Did yeah. you assign uh, p specific problems to? Well, we tried to or? get an agreement between the department and, and ourselves as to what might be an appropriate focus. And uh, so um, each, each, for example, when, uh, one student went out to Oakland and studied how that department was teaching about discretionary matters in their training program and what they might do to to beef up their training so that to equip police officers to, ec to better exercise discretion. And so in, in Madison, as part of this, you would send your students out, they would observe, and then you'd, they'd come back and, and you'd discuss it? What? Oh, yes. Well, in terms of, you know, just going out in the field, we used to send officers out, uh, send student, law school students out for eight hours, uh, and then after the eight hours and the er wee hours of the morning, come back and have a two-hour debriefing, and then it would influence their thinking for the rest of the semester. This, in, 1 a.m., 2 a.m.? Yeah, in the, in the courses that they, uh, they were taking, right? Right. Uh, and so you, you developed a relationship with the Madison Police Department as part of this process. Well, I, I, you know, being located in Madison, Ma uh, the, the department was my sort of laboratory from the time that I got there. But it really became the laboratory in 1972 with the appointment of an especially enlightened police chief in David Cooper. And uh, we were able to do all kinds of things with the department. And so that afforded the opportunity to do a very ambitious study of how we might actually implement problem oriented policing in its purest form uh, within the Madison Department. And so there were some, there was a specific project. We've got uh, the reports from the 1982 that are uh, here. Um, what, pro what problems did you focus on in that? We uh, examined two problems. One was the police response to the intoxicated, to the drinking driver and police response to uh, sexual assault. And as to the drinking driver, you know, there were all kinds of myths that prevailed in the department. 
you know, we arrest these people, nothing happens to them, go back out in the street, they drink some more. Um, the DA thought that he was seeing all the drunk drivers in the city of Madison. <clears throat> well, we dug into this thing in depth. And as, you know, again, reflecting the Bar Foundation study, <clears throat> we came to realize that uh, based upon the best data and studies that had been made up to that point, that on a Thursday night in Madison, after uh, one in the morning, there may have been as many as 6,000 people who had left the bars uh, who were over the uh, statutory limit for the amount of alcohol in their system. Uh, we looked at Madison police statistics and established that on the average Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, the department arrested three people. Now, that says something about discretion. You know, who are those three people, and why did you focus on them? And, 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 and it also says something about omnipotence. You know, you're not quite uh, being on top of this problem if you've got that many people on the street right. and only uh, the, a few people coming into the system. That shook people up a little bit, and it raises the question, well, then what, do you, what do you do about it? And you know, as an illustration here, we then began to explore alternatives to the prosecutions. And by the way, we established that all the arrests that were, that were made went through the courts, contrary to the police image that a lot of them got thrown out. They all were convicted. Well, one, uh, one of the, your, your, your findings here in Madison is the people within the police department didn't know what the rest of the organization was necessarily doing. Right. We had people we, we were told to talk to who knew everything that you ever wanted to know about drunk driving. But um, with due respect to them, um, they were operating under uh, impressions that had no basis in fact. Um, and so the, when, among the solutions, among the strategies that came out of this to illustrate the value of looking at problems is we discovered that, um, that the bars had a far greater potential for reducing the problem of the drinking driver than did the police department. And so we moved in the direction of tightening restrictions on bars and imposing re requirements on bartenders to, uh, about serving people who were intoxicated. And we created, for, among other things, a, a bartender school so that any, any bartender in Madison to this day has to get certification before he, can tend, uh, he or she can, can uh, uh, attend bar. Uh, as part of their responsibility to prevent drinking and driving. So th was this one of the very first examples of, of, of you know, bringing in you know, other groups, partners? Uh, Definitely. And, and using non-criminal uh, It was part of this you know, emphasis on you can do a lot more to prevent than just to depend upon the three arrests a night. Uh, and you could, uh, that the problem was much bigger than, than the police department recognized it to be and that others had an opportunity to contribute to reducing the problem in ways that were far more effective than anything that the police department can do. And that's really one of the core principles of, of community policing as well as, as problem-oriented yep. policing. Um, what, what, what did you learn from this, these experiments with the Madison Police Department uh, about the capacity of that department or a police department to really innovate? And the department was then on its way to be, to, in 1982, to becoming one of the best police departments in the country, very sophisticated, highly educated, uh, but suffered from a traditional um, limiting framework that uh, said our job is to enforce the law. That's, that's the old traditional model. Yeah. And uh, um, it was hard to get engagement. It was hard to say that research, having a person in a room studying, uh, was contributing to, a, uh, to an operation in which the, 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 the dominant theme was to get out there and make your presence felt. And so that, the, the people in the back room were sort of thought of as uh, not contributing mm -hmm. to, the, to the, the goal of the organization. Although, you, and it took a lot to say, look, if you invest in thinking about some of these issues, then the people who are out there might be much more effective in what they're doing with regard uh, to, to the problem. Moreover, the analytical ability. Departments, as I explained in the context of the Chicago Department, did not have the internal capacity to analyze problems in a creative, in-depth sort of way. Um, they didn't have people who were trained in that? 
They didn't have people who were trained in that. Mm -hmm. They didn't have peop they, they hadn't invested in trying to acquire that expertise. Right. Uh, do you think you made some progress in all of this time in, in sort of changing the, the understanding of, of this well, issue within Madison? I learned a long time ago that progress in policing is very, very slow. It it's moves in slow motion. Today, in the year 2004, if I jump the gun here, Madison Police Department has an analyst who's trained in social science research. And she uh, is, um, does what we had hoped they would start doing back in 1982. So it's taken a while, 20 years. but they have somebody when that person, when, when, when we went before the mayor and the city council to try to get support for this individual, they couldn't, couldn't quite understand why and were very reluctant to support it. And I was pleased to learn just a few weeks ago that she presented a very um, strong, insightful report about uh, control over alco alcohol serving beverages in the student area in Madison, and that the mayor acknowledged that now I understand why we want and need this position. And so, right. One of your students at uh, Wisconsin was Gary Hayes. Yes. Who is Gary and why was he important? Gary had been a police officer. He came to law school to study. He, he, said, he walked into my office and said, I'm, I'm not here to become a, police, a lawyer. I'm here to, to become a better police officer. And we stu he studied with me for three years, was my research assistant, and was there during these formative years. And uh, he, that is with regard to the pop concept. And uh, he was a very brilliant guy, a very energetic guy, and he contributed uh, to my work as my research assistant. Subsequently, through a series of steps, uh, very rapidly, he became the first executive director of PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum. Uh, when that, when they gave birth to that organization, and he shaped it. And one of his major themes, one of his major goals, when he became the executive director of PERF, was to be, to take this concept and to uh, use it and spread it around the country. Right. When G Gary graduated, he went to Boston. He went to Boston, Boston initially Department. and worked with uh, the commissioner there as his assistant. Uh, in that period when the Boston uh, schools were uh, integrated and the police had to deal with very violent protests. Yeah, quite a bit of conflict within the community. And, and right. Um, this was late 1970s. Right. And he, he gained some experience about that as another problem. Yes, that learned a lot about police. I think he actually moved into the police department, was executive assistant to the, uh, to the commissioner, and then he was tapped by Pat Murphy to become the first director of uh, the Police Executive Research Forum. Okay. Herman, by the late 1970s, uh, the whole concept of problem-oriented policing is really beginning to crystallize. Uh, had a chance to think about the Barr Foundation work and your experiences in Chicago. You've got these experiments with the Madison Police Department on drunk driving and, and re repeat sexual offenders. Um, at this point, you're, it's, it perf played a, a, a important role in disseminating it nationally. Can you explain parts of how PERF uh, did that? Well, because uh, Gary and I had a very, very close relationship, uh, has having been as, uh, in a student role, and we worked together for three years, not really toward the end more as colleagues than students, uh, than as student faculty. Um, so when uh, Gary uh, came to PERF, he, he, was pu he pushed me a great deal to to develop some programs and advance the concept. But he did more on his own than I was able to do. One of the things that he did was um, make it the subject of a whole series of seminars for the membership of, of PERF, which then was very small and selected. We should, I guess we should add uh, that, that PERF is, is a new uh, national professional association of chiefs and, and high-ranking uh, managers in police departments. Uh, it had much more of a research focus than other professional associations. Right. It's built into the title that this was, right. a, this was a commitment of police chiefs who were them also committed to doing research. Right. And, and, and this, this reflected the, the, the influence of your early work in thinking about uh, research is important in, in policing. You know, and we thought that it was important to incorporate that into, into a police leadership role. And the fir uh, PERF was very limited at the beginning to just 20 chiefs, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, all of whom sort of wrote a statement saying, I'm committed to this stuff, and I, and I don't care what the results are going to be. It's important that they right. get out. Right. And that was 
that was a very important thing because there was a big controversy about uh, some uh, some administrators uh, approving of research, but when the results came out <laughs> and challenged some of the things that are going on, that they won't, th there was some moves to suppress it. And so um, this was a commitment to right. openness. Right. And, and so PERF sponsors some of the first really major projects. Yes. Gary obtained funding from the what was the then federal agency, I forget if it was LEAA or one of its subsequent uh, incarnations, uh, to fund some problem-oriented projects in a number of communities. Five uh, total? I forget if it was four or five, but Newport was one of, you know, he, he, actually we, we st first effort related to Baltimore County and then Newport News and then after Newport News there were these four or five agencies Tulsa San Diego and a few others the Baltimore experiment was a coincidental sort of thing in which they were just moving toward uh, a, a very strong commitment to an a adding personnel to a prevention program and so perf with his, in his close collaboration with the then head of the Baltimore County Police Department uh, encouraged uh, Neil Behan to make problem-oriented policing the organizing theme of that new group of officers. So the officers were committed to problem-oriented policing, and that was very intensive. We did a lot of training with them, and the significance of that project was it took problem-oriented policing from studies at the department level down to officers and demonstrated that they had the capacity for looking at specific problems and br bringing creative responses to them. Right. And the other uh, important PERF project was uh, in Newport News, Virginia. Yeah. Uh, we have the report problem News, solving. Newport uh, News followed uh, uh, Baltimore County, uh, where the chief was Darrell uh, Stevens. And uh, there, that was, that was much more ambitious. It was funded by federal f funds. NIJ? And NIJ, and it was an effort to, and, and it had the support of PERF in the form of several researchers, John Eck and Bill Spellman, who worked with the Newport Department to take on a number of different projects and to, uh, problems and to demonstrate how intensive examination of those problems and development of creative responses could impact it. And it was significant in that it was thoroughly evaluated in a very you know, rigorous sort of way uh, and the results were, were published. Right. What were some of the problems? Problems in Newport News, there was a very large apartment complex where the, the area defined the problem, uh, Briarcliff, uh, and where this, the whole study was what was going on at Briarcliff, Cliff, uh, what were the um, landlord management relation, uh, landlord tenant relationships, uh, why these problems there, and that resulted in a total reorganization of the apartment complex uh, and, and its management. Right. And, but you were working other with, with really private individuals, landlords, uh, and, and with, with government other, other government agencies? Right. Um, what, sanitation? Uh, sanitation housing? people, it, it demonstrated the need to coordinate with all other city agencies, building inspection, uh, and the, the police department um, served as the coordinating force and also, it was the first time that a municipal police department confronted a federal agency that was responsible for this apartment complex and challenged them to get involved uh, and to respond differently to this particular local problem. And the, the standard approach, the old-fashioned approach, is, was just you know, wait more for cops. The wait for the calls to come, yeah. respond to the calls, and take reports. Right. If there's a upsurge in crime, more cops, uh, more patrolling, and then finally that fades away. So this is a much more of a, a the, the, the new problem solving approach. And the, the Newport News officers themselves were involved in the, in, the, in the thinking and the planning? Yes, this was a team of officers who worked in Bar Cliff, uh, and a lead officer, and it demonstrated another whole dimension of policing, that problem oriented policing has a way of being able to empower officers at the bottom of an organization giving them a, a new sense of purpose, a new sense of satisfaction uh, in their work, and a, a real sense of contribution to, to dealing with problems that otherwise the uh, thinking officer gets terribly frustrated by. Right. And the, the, the report on Newport News, Problem Solving, uh, disseminated uh, widely, I think had a huge uh, in, uh, influence in a terms of influence, right. spreading influence. What other ways did, did the idea of problem-oriented policing really begin to 
take hold nationally? Uh, well, there, there was a subsequent project in which they, uh, PERF, uh, launched projects in four or five communities. They, they had the funds with which to assign an analyst, a coordinator to each of the communities. And the, there was a requirement for coordination or at least sharing of experiences. And the San Diego project um, took the leadership in saying, let's get together and hold a conference and compare notes. And that was the beginning of what has become an annual tradition now of having an annual conference on problem-oriented policing, at which people from all over the country, initially just from those agencies, but subsequently from all agencies, uh, to come together uh, to, to reflect on what's been done in the, in the past year, both in, the, in, in, the term, in terms of research and in terms of actual implementation and what can we learn from them. So other departments would send officers and they would come and learn and that's how right. they... That grew I, from you know, 60, 70 people at the first meeting to way up, I think it would, uh, at its height, I think it may have been something like 1,600 who were coming together right. in San Diego to share in the reports and in the, in, in the discussions of what had been accomplished in the past year. And at the Puff Conference, they, uh, they were given an award every year? Uh, yes, the project? They, they introduced an award, I forget which year, uh, f uh, where they have a competition to, for, for agency to submit uh, descriptions of their problem-solving efforts. There's, a, there's a, um, a panel, a group of people who review those uh, projects, mm -hmm. those submissions, and then select the, the, the winners, and then the winners present at the conference. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of trying to institutionalize that right. and bring to the conference the best practices right. of the past year. And you're being very modest. It's actually the Herman Goldstein Award. Uh, I appreciate that. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, let's, let's look at, at where, where problem oriented policing stands today. How do you, do you think it's really taken hold? That's uh, a tough uh, and, and very uh, difficult question for me to answer because uh, it's now been, what, about, uh, 25 years since this got going. Yeah, well, your article <coughs> was 1979. So. Right. So it's exactly, you know, 25, 26 years. Uh, we've learned a lot. Some of the lessons are very powerful lessons, and I hope we'll be able to yeah. talk about that. Well, would you, should we talk about those now? What, what are the most important? Well, let's, let's well, okay. we, all right. Let's hold that for just a moment and right. just let me try to respond to your question about whether it's taken hold. It's, it's up, uh, up and down, up and down, up and down. There are departments where you have leadership that takes it some distance and then the leadership leaves and it disappears. Uh, there are departments in which just a core of operating police officers get committed to it. The administration knows nothing about it, but they, they accomplish miraculous stuff and get recognized for it. Again, illustrating your point we talked about earlier, sometimes the other people in the organization don't know what's going on in right. the other part. And we've had some departments that were identified nationally, internationally, for their problem-solving efforts, but with a change in administration, th there, there's not much happening there now. We, and then we've had some that have been fairly uh, consistent and have a strong commitment and have survived changes in administration. That is the concept of survival. What does it take within a department to, to have it, have, to, to ensure that continuity? Uh, clearly it's leadership, I mean the, the chief, chief It's executive. leadership, it's, it's how many people are really committed to it in the ranks. For example, I have an illustration now. One of the department, probably with policing was introduced in the UK and probably has taken stronger root in the UK than it has in the United States. Um, uh, under Sir Kenneth Newman, the London Metropolitan Police had um, several projects, on not unlike what we did in Madison in problem oriented policing. But as far as I know, it hasn't taken root in that department. But a Lancashire, uh, Lancashire Constabulary, um, made a commitment to this some um, maybe 12 years ago or so under one chief constable. I continued under uh, second chief constable Paul Stevenson, who's now the new deputy commissioner in, in London. And, uh, and I'm told just by con correspondence this week uh, that their middle management is continuing the commitment. And they are so committed that they have an annual conference on problem-oriented policing at which 
their own personnel show their wares, show, show, display their accomplishments of the past year, and they have competition within the department for who has done engaged in, in, in the most uh, problem oriented policing. So, you know, from among all the agencies that I'm familiar with, the Lancashire Police have the strongest commitment and have uh, shown the greatest accomplishment over a continuing period of time. So it, it's, it's really an international phenomenon at this point? Yes. Is, is there this problem with policing uh, that has been going on in, in some uh, s substantial volume in Australia, um, Norway, Sweden, um, the UK, uh, here, and in a few other countries. What are some of those powerful lessons that you referred to that we now have learned? Um, well, uh, th they take two forms. One is you know what we've learned uh, to give us more insight into what we can do about the policing function. The other is what we've learned about the impediments. As to the impediments, I'd say what we've learned is much depends, future progress depends upon uh, leadership. And we're, we, we suffer in that area because the turnover in leadership and policing is so rapid. Um, the lack of, uh, of analysis, in-depth analysis, and the skill and the capacity to do that. And the lack, uh, the failure to develop, at least in this area, closer university uh, academic, uh, practitioner relationships and feedback. And we can, maybe we want to elaborate on that. Well, there, well there, there are plenty of research projects where you know, academics are, are involved in you know, some research project with the police department. But that's not quite what you have in mind in terms of this well, my, analysis and problem solving. Yeah, my criticism of that, and I, I have watched for all these years the development of the whole discipline you know, and the commitment to studies relating to policing from the early explorations, Bar Foundation, Al Reese's efforts, et cetera, uh, to this day. And um, my disappointment is that relatively little academic research has focused on specific problems other than those that become politically mm -hmm. sensitive like domestic violence, child abuse, uh, sexual assault. Use of force. Use of force. Traffic stops, racial profiling. Right, right. That s crises define them and then they get attention. But there's relatively little in the curriculum or, or research agenda of of the academic enterprise that draws a student attention otherwise and research attention to the handling of specific issues, right. uh, specific problems. And I think that it, because of that, there isn't the generation from within the academic field of, of authoritative, knowledgeable you know, pieces that contribute to a body of knowledge on which police can draw right. to improve their capacity for dealing with graffiti, uh, for dealing with um, identification theft, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That just hasn't happened over the years. And, and that, that relates back to the, your, your second point about the, the lack of a capacity for analysis in, in so many police departments. Uh, right. There's, is, do you see that that analytic unit or the problem solving unit as a, as a special unit within a department, or is this something that, that, that you sort of farm out to in some relationship with the university setting? What, what, what's missing well, there, here? there are various models that have been tried and used. I, you know, unfortunately, if, if it's done outside, then it's always outside, and it's not internalized. I, would, I, I see no reason why police departments shouldn't develop their own internal analytic capacity. But to do that, they have to isolate it from the other stuff or it gets subsumed, it gets mm -hmm. used up in responding to the problems of the day. You know, you got a serious homicide problem, so you bring in the analysts to work on that, and they're drawn away from the, the long-range right. commitments. Or if there's a budget crisis, this is the first unit to go because exactly. you want to have exactly because you can't have empty holstered cops. You have to have uh, you have to get everybody into a uniform so that they can be out there doing their thing. And that I think is dysfunctional. I think it's it's very short-sighted uh, in that it it says. Um, the important thing is to have as many people out there, but we're not as concerned about what they're doing. Whereas I think the investment in an analyst has, I, I would, for example, argue that if you, when we, when we were in the, in the era of the 100,000 additional police, that used to bug me because um, f 
for every X number of police officers added to a police department, there ought to be an analyst mm -hmm. to make sure that those people are being used in a way that is effective and has a, a direct impact on the ultimate product of police. Yeah, the the 100,000 officer concept is sort of the old more cops. Add more, add more cops. More that'll cops, do, more patrol, job, right? as, as opposed to... Without, without the thought processes that are involved in what we do with cops right. and what we use them for. Do you, I mean, are the, have you thought about ways in which police departments can develop this internal... I mean, assuming the leadership and assuming there's no budget crisis and you've got... Uh, of, of developing these kinds of units. I, uh, I've written a piece in which I've argued that there ought to be a... One of the most effective things that the federal government could do would be to systematically inject thought processes into police departments by providing their funding. Um, you know, because it's difficult to argue for this at the local basis. They'll say, well, why do we need this person? You know, isn't somebody else doing this? And if, if, if we could have a, a, a critical mass injection of analysts in departments, and if they shared th their experiences and their knowledge among them, we could quickly demonstrate the contribution this was, would make to improve policing. Uh, and and there's a, there is a project that has been launched along these lines. Currently, uh, there is a project um, under Mike Scott's direction in which he has the funds for, I think, three or four analysts who he has placed in departments. One of them is, um, some of the funding is in Chula Vista, California. Some is in Madison, Wisconsin in an effort to demonstrate that putting an analyst in a department. Mm -hmm. The other major effort along these lines is the Joe Dando Institute in, at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in London under Gloria Laycock is doing a much more thorough job of training uh, police uh, analysts and equipping them to function in, in, in police departments. Mm -hmm. And the most, I think one of the most significant things is that there will, in, within the next few months, uh, be published uh, a manual on problem analysis for in crime analysis, which is an effort to educate these people about what is involved in analyzing problems. Tell us about Mike Scott and his center. Mike uh, is another former student of mine who has a very uh, um, unique career of having uh, he you know, Madison police officer and then uh, Harvard Law School graduate. Uh, legal cons uh, uh, one of the assistant legal counsels in New York City, uh, um, served in several different capacities, was a chief of police in Florida and executive assistant to the chief of police in St. Louis. So he has a very um, a varied career that has, uh, and, and he is strongly uh, involved and committed to problem oriented policing. He now is back at the University of Wisconsin where he heads uh, um, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with the university, the Center for Problem Oriented Policing. And they have produced a series of guides on different problems. This is a, problems. a major current project of great, great international significance because these guides are not only in published form like that, but they are available on the web, on, on, on Mike's web page. And uh, um, the significance of this, in a nutshell, is that up to now, we've been thinking of police departments having the capacity to do a case study here, a case study here, very spotty, get an insight and, and, and share that insight with others. And that hasn't quite taken as strong a form as I would have hoped in terms of the volume, in terms of the sharing, in terms of journals. Uh, Mike is doing this in reverse. He's commissioning people to look at specific problems and go into the literature and find out what we do know from the academic community, from police departments, from the case studies, synthesizing that and in sort of a state of the art saying, this is what we know about graffiti. This is what we know about street prostitution. This is what we know about panhandling. And this is what we know about salts in, in around bars. And there's going to be, I think there's, between what's been written and going to be published, it'll be around 60 so far. And uh, these are generally available, and our hope is that this is the beginning of a building of knowledge to support true professionalism in policing. So in terms of you know, disseminating POP and, and the, the concept, and PERF played a major role, certainly late 70s, early 80s, and now the center at uh, University of Wisconsin under Mike Scott is, 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 is a national uh, focus, I think. You know, it's resource center. Yeah. And, and, right. uh, um, so do you think POP has a future? Um, I'm optimistic and I'm pessimistic. 
I'm optimistic in terms of the potential. I've come to realize that you name the problem <laughs> in policing today, whether it's an abuse problem, whether it's um, an efficiency problem, whether it's relationship with community problem, and I think if I can push you to look at that problem in the context of specific problems that you will come out more satisfied and more productive than if you just examine that problem in the abstract. And you're pessimistic? My pessimism is that the progress has been so incredibly slow and in that uh, you know, there are police and there are police in this country. We tend to think of them all as uniform, but there are police departments that are at the cutting edge and there are police departments that are operating in the dark ages. And uh, it, um, there are other pressures on police. The, the current pressure to deal with you know, ter terrorism, uh, important as that is, uh, has sidetracked a lot of these efforts to deal more effectively with substantive problems. Um, and they, with limited resources, limited personnel, I understand the police chief who listens to some of what I have to say and says, and this can express great enthusiasm, but also says it's not realistic. Right. Well, looking back over 50 years, you can really see the tremendous transformation of, of American policing. From oh, yes. When you first went out that 1956, uh, our understanding of what police uh, do, is it was, just uninformed, really, and uh, you've really played a major role in, in all of the, the milestones from the Bar Foundation survey to, to the President Crime Commission, the very first experiments in problem oriented policing in Madison and, and in Newport News, and now the institutionalized center at, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it's been a remarkable career. You've made a tremendous contribution to uh, uh, policing. I'm cautiously optimistic, uh, and I want to thank you for you know sharing the uh, this experience with us. Thank you very much.